Hello everyone. This is Shobha from CNS and welcome to the first episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, which is a special series of online interviews every fortnight with leaders in the Asia Pacific on the overarching theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific, the 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities as we face them today. This is also the theme of the forthcoming 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, which we more commonly call APCR SHR 10. That is the short form, that big conference. These dialogues will be streamed live on the Facebook pages of APCR SHR 10 and CNS. And isn't it a strange coincidence that today is also World Cancer Day, the day we are beginning this dialogue series. In today's inaugural episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, we are in conversation with Dr. Chiwon Wark, who is the convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. And he is also the executive director of Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, RHAC. Welcome, Dr. Chiwon. Welcome to today's dialogue. Uh, and just before we begin, a few housekeeping announcements for the viewers. Uh, those of you who are using the Zoom platform can type in your comments and questions in the chat box, which you must be seeing on your screen, and then unmute, unmute yourself to speak at the end of the dialogue, or you can raise the virtual hand. If you're watching it on Facebook Live, you can leave a comment there and we will try to take up as many comments as possible, uh, given the shortage of time. Uh, Dr. Chon, why was Cambodia selected to hold the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights? Any special reason for choosing Cambodia? Um, yes, your, your questions. Uh, before uh, answering this, uh, please note that this uh, Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Sexual Health and Rights, just, we just refer to the conference now. It, it is a two yearly conference, so it's held every uh, two years and with an average of uh, 1,500 participants coming from across Asia, Pacific and, and the world. So, and your question is why uh, Cambodia is uh, selected for uh, hosting this. I think the, um, the International uh, Steering Committee of the uh, conference looking into a, a country where uh, it's linked to major international uh, airport in the region. So uh, accessibility from uh, airport, from main airport in the regions, that's one thing. The second is the uh, facilities uh, of that uh, country to um, host the conference. And the second is, um, is the uh, convenience for entry visas that people from over the world can uh, easily access and have visa online, so on the arrival. So that's the general things. But the uh, other more important thing is the environment related to sexual and reproductive health and rights in the countries. Uh, the um, government support for the conference. And the third is uh, there's a availability available of uh, NGOs like RAC, uh, which is uh, capable of uh, hosting uh, this conference. And, and RAC, we have a long history uh, in uh, working with uh, sexual and reproductive health and um, have a long uh, cooperation with the uh, government. So I think for all these uh, reasons. Okay. Uh, can you highlight some of the major achievements uh, Cambodia has made uh, pertaining to the theme of the conference, uh, that is the 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities uh, in the field of SRHR, that is sexual and reproductive health and rights. Right. Uh, I think um, uh, overall, um, I'm talking in, in, in general, first overall health status of the people has improved uh, through expansions and increase of uh, coverage of medical facilities.
together with increased social health protection system. I think this is very important and measures to improve financing of the uh, sectors. And um, sexual and reproductive health, as well as other health in general, benefit from developments within the health sectors, as well as sectors with direct effect on health, such as infrastructure, economic growth, and poverty reduction. So these all play major roles in improving um, the health life ex expectancies of the people. And uh, please note that when we talking about uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights in uh, SDGs, so we talk about universal access to sexual and reproductive health services, issue related to um, genders, uh, comprehensive sexuality education, maternal mortality, uh, deaths, and integrations of reproductive health into national strategies and program. I think Cambodia, have done uh, very well in recent past. I think you may have known like in terms of the maternal mortality ratio uh, reduction and um, the uh, example, you know, it's fall from 470 uh, death per 100,000 live birth uh, in uh, 2005 uh, to 170 in 2014. So Cambodia now is, uh, we are uh, in the process of um, uh, doing another round of Cambodia demographic health surveys. As, as you may know that each, uh, most of the developing country have this demographic health survey. And this is one of the uh, national survey which measures uh, things that related to um, women's health and sexual and reproductive health uh, in, in, in general. And uh, I think Cambodia doing very well in terms of like skill birth attendance, birth at the facilities, pregnancy care, example, like uh, um, the visits of uh, pregnancy care visits is more than 90% for all the pregnant women in Cambodia. And HIV AIDS, you know, Cambodia has already achieved the result, the 90, 90, 90 uh, targets before the 2020. So it, this is um, uh, a very uh, good uh, performance for Cambodia and, and only uh, one among the uh, seven uh, countries um, who achieved the result, 1990 uh, results. And you know, major expansion has been made in the number of health centers. So the last five years, Cambodian government have added about approximately like 100 health centers and 30 uh, hospitals into the health system. So this is like an, um, a fast increase in uh, number of health facility. This means increase in uh, accessibility uh, for uh, all uh, the uh, health issue, but also uh, sexual and reproductive health. And uh, we also have a better availability of private clinics and pharmacy. And uh, Cambodian National uh, Sexual and Reproductive Health Programs now approaching the ends of the five-year national strategy for sexual and reproductive health 2016 and 2020. So uh, we are currently in the process of reviewing and developing the, five, the next five-year strategy covering important key sexual and reproductive health interventions like family planning, abortion, sexual and gender-based violence, youth-friendly services, and other interventions aiming to improve uh, maternal mortality, uh, infant mortality, adolescent uh, fertility. Another thing that I would like to highlight is the Ministry of Education in terms of health education. So the Council of the Ministers uh, endorsed the school health policies in uh, 2019. And uh, the Ministry of Education has endorsed the um, health education uh, framework and syllabus. And this health education, uh, including sexual and reproductive health education. So we, uh, we among us as a sexual and reproductive health uh, professional, we uh, call uh, the comprehensive sexuality education. So um, the Ministry of Health has uh, included this uh, subject as a compulsory subject. And, and now uh, the uh, textbook is being uh, developed um, from the grade one to grade 12. 
And I think um, we will finish this in 2021 and the rolling out starting from 2022. So this is a good news for Cambodians and, and uh, Cambodian young in, in, in general. Sexual and reproductive health programs and the Ministry of uh, Women's Affairs also include the sexual and gender-based violence in their strategy and programming. So this um, sexual and gender-based and gender-based violence is supported by higher level policies and law. So the implementation has been reviewed and, and improved. So I, I think this is just like um, um, some of the few things that I would like to mention here. Okay, so it seems that Cambodia is on track to meet the 23rd day uh, SRHR related uh, sustainable development goals. Am I right? Is Cambodia on track to meet them? Um, uh, most of the thing, yes, yes. Uh, there are a few things that uh, um, it, we, we need to do more, but I, I hope that everything will be uh, on track with the level of the commitment from the government and participation from uh, CSO and the uh, uh, population groups. Okay, so so what are the major challenges which you face and uh, what are the fields where you said that some improvement is required? So could you just uh, pinpoint that? I think, you know, um, challenges, um, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, I just uh, want to um, like challenge in general. So uh, there are challenges ranging from individual belief to an organized, a more organized movement against uh, sexual and reproductive health and rights. But this is in some country and internationally. But in this sense, Cambodia is seen as a more uh, liberal and progressive society regarding to sexual and reproductive health and rights. And you know, I I would like uh, all of us to note that sexual and reproductive health and right fall within the scope of uh, fundamental human rights, and it's uh, central to eradicating poverty and achieving sustainable development across social, economics, and environmental uh, dimensions. And uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, challenges, I understand that states and development partners have limited resources with many competing priority. So um, I think uh, it is important to ensure that um, sexual and reproductive health and rights is valued. Uh, we need to think about it when resources are mobilized and allocated. So indeed, sexual and reproductive health programs, I think in Cambodia and also in uh, many other countries in, in our region, uh, will require increased and sustained funding in order to uh, for relevant SDG to be achieved by the 20, 20, uh, 2030 uh, deadline. So, and, you know, there's um, also other challenges like uh, a long, uh, like uh, established and new established norm and new emerging norms that affects behaviors related to um, sexual and reproductive health and rights. So, so this norm uh, may result in either positive change or uh, reinforcement the harmful gender and sexual norms. So this, uh, you know, might uh, affect uh, the um, the um, uh, populations. Uh, you know, like some group of the population um, ones are more than uh, the others. So I think the, um, also, you know, um, Cambodia and so like. Uh, other country in the region. So the, we have made um, you know, effort in uh, among the marginalized groups such as women, youth, um, people with disability and LGBTQI uh, people. But these people are still disproportionately subjected to uh, multiple levels of social, economic and legal discrimination. So I think you know these these are the um, challenges uh, Cambodian and I think other country in the Asia Pacific and um, also other country uh, face it. Uh, it just like uh, it just to some degree you know different degree level uh, between uh, the countries. Okay, but yes, but the other countries have a lot to learn from Cambodia. Also, I think uh, particularly the. Um, 
education part of it, which you were talking, that comprehensive sex, sex education to children, I think that's a very big step in the right direction. Uh, Dr. Shivan, today's World Cancer Day, and uh, at least two cancers, uh, uh, breast cancer and cervical cancer, are directly related to women's sexual and reproductive health. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you please share with us what Cambodia is doing to tackle them? Uh, yes, uh, right. Um, um, uh, today is uh, World uh, Cancer Day, and we happen to talk on this. And I'm glad uh, that you uh, mentioned uh, this. Um, in Cambodia, um, you know, uh, cervical cancer is uh, one of the um, big cause of uh, mortality among the uh, women. So um, I think. Um, it is estimated that about uh, 1,500 uh, new cases are happening, cervical cancer happening uh, per year, and resulted in like nearly 800 deaths each year. So this is um, a number is uh, you know is high uh, numbers uh, caused by the uh, cervical cancer, and uh, uh, this is a public health issue. Cambodia Ministry of Health since um, I think uh, 2013 I have introduced the uh, screening program, cervical screening uh, program. So seeing uh, we don't have uh, like uh, other uh, highly uh, sophisticated detection. So Cambodia as recommended by WHO, uh, we use uh, 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 VIA, visual inspection with acid acetic. Uh, as a screening method. So we use a see and treat approach. So um, Ministry of Health with the support from uh, health partners and NGO. So we've been uh, training um, midwives uh, who work at the health center uh, level to do uh, BIA and provide them with the uh, uh, facility to uh, treat. We use uh, cryotherapy for early uh, uh, treatment. Um, so, but I acknowledge that uh, Cambodia need to uh, do a lot more uh, in terms of uh, primary uh, prevention. So uh, as you know, you know, uh, WHO already uh, recommended to provide HPV vaccines uh, for the girl eight, uh, eight, uh, eight from uh, nine to 14. But uh, I think Cambodia be cannot afford uh, to have this uh, uh, vaccine yet. But um, you know, I hope that uh, Cambodian government will um, uh, consider introducing HPV vaccine um, uh, in addition to the screening programs um, that we are uh, doing right now. OK. Uh, what is your optimistic hope versus your realistic expectations regarding sexual and reproductive uh, health uh, and rights in the Asia Pacific region, uh, also in Cambodia. What do you hope for and what is, uh, what is realistic? Um, I, I, I think, you know, what I hope is uh, coming from, you know, my calculated and informed uh, expectation. So for Cambodia, I, I, I hope that Cambodia will achieve its uh, SDG goal related to sexual reproductive and rights. So, and uh, as it says, no one is left behind. All the individual will have access to sexual and reproductive health and rights information, services, and have freedom to decide about their sexuality without coercion and judgment. So Cambodia is seriously working toward these 2030 goals. And I, you know, I also just um, attended the Nairobi um, ICPD uh, 25. So uh, many uh, country in, in the Asia Pacific, many government have uh, promised and make a commitment uh, in the conference and also uh, private sectors uh, together have I have a pledge uh, funding. So uh, I, I feel like, um, you know, we have a high uh, momentum for sexual and reproductive health and uh, let hope for, for the best. But um, uh, we, need, uh, we need to 
uh, to keep the momentum high. That's why you know we uh, decide to have this uh, regular uh, Asia Pacific conference on sexual and reproductive health and rights uh, every two years to keep this uh, momentum to update uh, all the stakeholders and to strategize you know ourselves individual countries and in the region uh, how we are going to move uh, to achieve this goal for uh, the remaining years okay uh, now regarding the forthcoming conference uh, can you please share uh, uh, what efforts are being made to ensure uh, participation of diverse populations and the hearing of underrepresented voices at APCR SHR 10? Um, I think, you know, when, when we talking about diversity, uh, the conference um, steering committee, we got international steering committee, the national steering committees, we talk and we discussed a lot about diversity. So diversity in terms of population groups, such as women, men, adolescent, uh, people with disability, LG, uh, LGBT uh, community. So this is like uh, population groups. Diversity in terms of geography representation across Asia and Pacific. So uh, that's, uh, we discussed about the diversity. And to ensure this first, we look at the uh, abstracts presenters. So uh, abstracts uh, is first selected based on their scientific merit and relevance to the conference theme. But we also include other criteria in our final decision making like geographical, geographical representation, adolescents um, who uh, uh, have uh, submitted their abstract, people with disabilities, and make sure that all sexual reproductive issues are selected to ensure a more balanced, diverse subject to be discussed in the conference. And you know, to to uh, to ensure that um, uh, people with no academic background and would be able also to join and to make their voice heard, our international steering committee members develop abstract development guideline, which is uh, suitable for a non-academic person. And we develop the videos, like how a video uh, uh, for the guidelines, like how to uh, write an, an abstract uh, if you are not an academic uh, person. So I think, uh, you know, this is part of the things that uh, we want to uh, ensure that uh, those coming uh, from various uh, backgrounds uh, can join. Second is uh, with the plenary speakers. So, um, so we uh, also carefully uh, invite uh, plenary speaker. Of course, uh, they are expert in their own area, but we also consider um, uh, the other criteria similar to uh, what we used in the abstract uh, selection. And the third is um, you know, about the scholarship. So uh, as uh, a, a tradition for our conference, we uh, allocate uh, budgets or we raise fund for providing scholarship. And in this, you know, to, to make sure that uh, people from various backgrounds, uh, geographical representation uh, have access to the conference or join the conference, we have a formula for budget uh, scholarship allocation uh, for those uh, for those group. So I think and also the secretary of the conference has developed measures for the conference logistic to ensure that participants enjoy foods and their stays with acceptable facility to maintain their daily practice of diverse culture and religion. So I, I think this is a, a number of um, uh, measures that uh, we want uh, we, we want to um, ensure that uh, there will be a diverse group and uh, uh, diverse geographical representations um, in the conference. Okay. Uh, why should people from across Asia Pacific and beyond uh, come to attend APCR SHR 10? 
uh, as I, I I said you know earlier the you know in the in this conference uh, governments development partner CSO representative of diverse population groups will get together so uh, you know to uh, together to review the progress share the lesson learned including challenges. So they also have the opportunity to strengthen their collaboration, forging new partnership. And as I said, you know, as a section reproductive health advocate, uh, service provider, policy maker, uh, development partner. So we need uh, to keep this momentum high for section reproductive health and rights. And through this conference, we will be able to create an environment for the countries for the region, for the world, the environment in which we are able to achieve what the government and all the stakeholders promised for the uh, SDG. Okay, and uh, likewise for local delegates also uh, to I, exchange knowledge uh, with the rest. Yes. The local, local uh, yeah, um, yes. The, the, the um, International Steering Committee, the National Steering Committee uh, put a high value on the uh, local um, delegate participation uh, in, 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 in the uh, conference. So um, I also would like to urge the uh, local uh, participant to register and make uh, our voice heard and, and change the lesson and share the lesson we learned or we get new lessons from other countries and the region. I think this is a very uh, good opportunity for uh, not the local uh, participant, but like a country team, country team composed of government, development partners, civil societies, and representative of uh, population groups get together and get to learn from other countries, share experience from uh, our country, and going back uh, strategize ourselves and what to do next to achieve uh, this SDG. Okay. Uh, anything else you would like to share, which uh, I might have missed out, but uh, if you think is uh, pertinent and important, I think you um, you know you ask uh, all the um, uh, important and relevant um, um, questions. So um, okay. uh, I think it, it's good. Okay, thank you. And uh, your message for APCR SHR 10? So my message? Yes, your message. Um, I, uh, you know, hope that um, this is uh, a big and high time for all of us who uh, are the advocates, who are the health professionals, um, you know, the, the supporter of sexual and reproductive health and rights is a high momentum for uh, all of us, in particular in the Asia and Pacific uh, region, uh, to get um, together and uh, making uh, one voice and uh, make the world heard uh, so that we use this momentum to achieve what all of us, including the government, have promised for the uh, SDG. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Trevon. Thank you very much uh, for this dialogue. And uh, uh, I now invite the listeners for their comments and questions. We already have a lot many comments and questions. I'll just open the chat box after this and see what is there. And if you are using the Zoom platform, please type in your questions and comment in the chat box uh, or raise the virtual hand. And if you wish to speak, you can unmute, unmute yourself and ask your question. If you are watching it on Facebook Live, you can leave a comment there. Uh, so let me open the chat box and see what is there in it for us. Uh, we have a question from Abhina. Abhina, if you are there, would you like to speak, please? If Abhina would like to speak. Okay, Abhina is, I think we all know her. She is a great transgender activist. 
and uh, she wants to know how Cambodia is addressing issues related to high risk communities such as sex workers, transgender uh, men who have sex with men and uh, injecting drug users, issues their issues related to SRHR. Um, um, thank you for um, the uh, questions and um, so, um, um, you know, uh, Cambodia are, are related to like LGBT uh, people, men have sex with men, transgender. So, um, so how Cambodia uh, deal with uh, uh, this uh, population's uh, group? Um, I first, you know, I'm glad uh, to uh, say that uh, Cambodia is a more tolerant society uh, toward uh, LGBT um, people. And um, so, uh, but of course, you know, we don't have a specific uh, law uh, protecting their right. Um, you know, we, we, we have a, like a general law uh, protecting the rights of the men and the women, uh, but uh, we need to have a law specifically addressing um, discriminations and protecting the rights of the uh, LGBT uh, people. But um, I think uh, in a sense that Cambodian society is more tolerant. So um, 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 I, uh, it's uh, um, the LGBT uh, community in, in Cambodia, they um, can form together, uh, you know, there's an NGO, there are civil society uh, who support the LGBT uh, communities. And you know, when the government have a HIV aid uh, programs uh, intervention, I just told you that uh, Cambodia have done uh, very well in terms of HIV aid. So um, the uh, policies and the guideline um, is very well uh, including and aware of the uh, issue related to the LGBT uh, community. So, um, um, but I, I, I think that uh, we need uh, to do more. We need to have like a, uh, a law specifically protecting the LGBT right um, and um, put, um, you know, uh, that help uh, reducing the um, discriminations, uh, stigma and discriminations among this uh, group of population. Uh, we have Rania Khori from Jordan. Uh, Rania, could you please ask your question? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, sadly, Jordan is not as liberal as Cambodia or maybe the other countries uh, in terms of uh, LGBT communities. Or uh, it is still uh, because uh, the rule of Sharia ah in in our country, uh, the Islam is the rule. And uh, I think, according to the Quran, I am not a Muslim. Uh, uh, homosexuality is prohibited. So uh, people uh, stay in the closets. They don't come out of the closets and they do not, I could not even write in my nonprofit that I am, I am, I do not discriminate. I said, I do not discriminate according to race, sex, sexual orientation. And they asked me to remove that. Uh, the lawyer said, we cannot say sexual orientation in our country because we do not allow anything other than straight. I mean, I'm sure there are many people who are not, but they are afraid to come out of the closet. And if they do, it's in their own small circles. Now, my question, because uh, you are lucky that you're in such a liberal country and very open-minded about sex education. Now, we do require reproductive health, sexual education in terms of preventative health, so, like you said, to prevent uh, um, disease that uh, could be prevented uh, and, and so on and so forth. So. Can you recommend, please, uh, uh, agencies or organizations that might fund our work in Jordan that I can write a proposal to or maybe contact? Because here it's very tough for anyone in terms of advocacy, even if I try my best to advocate for sexual and reproductive health, it's very tough to find funding. It's not a high priority. I mean, 
you know, they, we have so many more problems like economic and poverty. And, and so, so they look at me like, you know, we want to put food on our table, you know. <laughs> we don't need you to educate us about what you do. But I believe in the importance of this kind of health empowerment. Can I just interrupt here for a moment? Uh, I think we should know that Rania is executive director of Artika for empowerment and awareness raising. Am I right, Rania? Yes, yes. Our nonprofit is called Artika for Empowerment and Awareness Raising. We participated as part of the NCD Alliance Global Week for Action. I had a very strong advocacy walk in Jordan. We were put on the map. And uh, um, I was uh, also, I do preventative health lectures on uh, how to prevent diabetes, uh, awareness and cancer. And so it's more preventative versus curative health and, and catering to women and youth in marginalized areas. We try to go to the outskirts where people are far away from hospitals or the clinics will close by the afternoon and we try to see what we are going to do. But I have no funding to support any activity relevant to sexual reproductive health. So that's why I, I, I asked this question. Okay. Um... Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, telling us uh, the situation in Jordan. Um, um, for related to uh, funding, I'm not a good person, you know, talking about uh, funding. Uh, we also running an NGO we call RA, but uh, I know that there's a number of uh, uh, countries uh, who um, are very supportive of uh, LGBT uh, issues. Uh, in Cambodia, like my organization, uh, we get funding support from uh, CEDA. So I think the government of uh, Sweden is uh, very uh, supportive of the issues. And uh, um, I think a number of uh, uh, other countries like Norway government and the European uh, Commission's uh, group also very uh, supportive uh, of the uh, issue of um, sexual and reproductive health and, and rights. And I, I'm sure that in Jordan, there's a, 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 an NGO, the member of the IPPF, uh, uh, the organization that I'm working for, is uh, also the member of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, IPPF. So if you talk uh, to them. International, international what? International? Planned Parenthood Federation. But uh, in Jordan, I think uh, it would call Jordan Family Planning Association or Jordan something. It's a member oh. of IPPF. So uh, I think, um, you know, um, uh, this group uh, similar to RA in Cambodia, um, you know, follow uh, the same concept of uh, IPPF. So we support sexual and reproductive health and rights. Thank you. So you don't, you can't like this, you, you're suggesting I, I was thinking what are, if you could write down like just the organizations which you contact, it's only CEDA and you said Norway, Sweden and uh, the European Commission. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but Thank uh, in you. your country there's an IPPF member associations in, in your country, in Jordan, I think. Okay, so because if I contact them, they will still tell me there's no funding. People want to work with us and want our programs and want us to be part partners with them, but there is no funding. Mm -hmm. So we want to do the work, but without funding, I can't employ people. I can't uh, uh, pay the drivers that take us to the outskirts of the villages. We drive three hours uh, in, in very, you know, dangerous uh, roads. And mm -hmm. so um, we need funding to cover the costs of these awareness raising campaigns. Sure. So that's why that's why I wanted to see where I can find funding, mm -hmm. because I really want to help and do the programs. But without funding, I cannot. I'm paralyzed. Mm. I am not trying to change the society. I am not saying um, I want Jordan to be different. I just want to try to educate people so they will live. Uh, uh, um, like you said, it's a fundamental human rights to to have access and information of things relevant to their body and to their health as females. So, and even as males. So, uh, 
and also uh, when we talk about uh, sexual and reproductive health, you know, there's the sexual harassment, there's the rape. In our country, we might not even go to the LGBT uh, section because it's not talked about. But there is a lot of sexual harassment in the, you know, in, a, in, in public places, maybe in the transportation, in workplaces. Um, uh, there is uh, rape even in marriages. There is forced rape because he thinks that he paid for his wife or his wife belongs to him. So it's okay for him to rape her. You know, you know, because if there is no consent, even in a marriage, it's rape. So, so this is more the type of sexual health that we might be tackling in terms of uh, rape, of, of teaching the kids that, you know, nobody can touch their private parts, uh, you know, to, to, you know, to talking about things uh, where uh, kids might be harassed and they don't understand what to do and they're fearful. We don't have very strong rules about uh, you know, uh, you know, they don't do fingerprinting in our schools like they do in the U.S. So there might be many pedophiles or sexual harass harassers who choose to be around kids. So this is also violence against children. Not only, you know, this is important for kids to know. Nobody should touch them. Nobody should touch them in that area. Um, nobody is allowed to, you know, you, you understand what I'm saying. So this is the type of sexual and reproductive health prevention that I'm looking to do more uh, for the younger generation through either the schools or through awareness raising. And of course, for the older, for the women to know things relevant, uh, uh, relevant to amnorrhea, to uh, uh, relevant to uh, 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 like, um, like with menopause and things like that. And also maybe some types of congenital abnormalities that could be prevented as a result of uh, uh, having the right diet or being careful not to be subjected to radiation or other things that might increase chances of, like for instance, uh, uh, in, in certain remote areas, they still don't know to take folic acid to prevent spina bifida, which is completely preventable if they took folic acid. So this is what we mean when we talk about uh, uh, the reproductive and sexual health. It's more about uh, a prevention of uh, violence, of acts of violence against the young girls and boys and children and and even the women, even in marriages, because, uh, you know, the men think they, it's okay to, you know, to do something the woman says no to because he's married to her. Yeah. So well, there is this culture, if you know what I mean, right? Yeah. And we also had, a, we, we had a law where actually a rapist could marry his uh, uh, victim. They just canceled it two years ago. But yeah. until two years ago in Jordan, if somebody raped me, they could marry me and they get out of child, uh, prison. And can you believe a woman having to, to live all her life with her rapist? Women, uh, you know, this, this, I think from a psychological mental health uh, issue, rather, other than the physical, this is an atrocity. Now they canceled this law, but just recently. But there are many other things that happen where women uh, might be sexually abused uh, and even girls, and they accept it because they think it's okay nobody told them they can't say they they can they can stop it or maybe they're afraid to stop it we have the the awareness raising is is a little bit i mean maybe we should empower women to and girls to know that they deserve better they should be able to not only when they say no no means no and and they should be treated with respect and not sexual objects because in this society, uh, a, a woman is, uh, uh, it is, uh, you know, the men, they, they do have that. Uh, it is, I'm generalizing, of course, but uh, um, women are, uh, you, know, you know, being attractive and being wanted by a man to be, you know, is, is a big deal. So, I mean, it's everywhere in the world, but, but, but then men sometimes treat women as subordinates. Um, and so there is this kind of abuse, even in relationships. We are not talking about the girlfriend, boyfriend. We're talking about marriages. Okay. Like, yeah. I, I know, I know, I know from stories where women were raped in marriages. Thank you very much for, for sharing um, and the, the stories. And um, I think, you know, that's, that is uh, the reason that we organize the conference. And I think you may meet, uh, you know, development partner, donors uh, in the conference, and you may uh, make network 
So this is part of the uh, uh, the one of the conference uh, objective to uh, make people like you, you know, have uh, connections with the new partners, stakeholders. Um, so uh, please, yeah, if you have the opportunity to join the conference. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I, we can't afford it with our nonprofit. I was just telling you we need funding. I can't, I can't use the money which we will get for programs to come to the conference and we already are trying to fund programs and activities. But yes, I, I appreciate, thank you for listening to my story. I mean, I am speaking, um, I, I am sure there are even more uh, worse stories in many other parts of the world. In our case, the Syrian refugees in the camps, I've heard a lot of uh, things that happened where they had to do the child marriage or marry their uh, children at younger ages to keep them safe from rape or from poverty. Because, you know, we, have a mil we had a million something uh, Syrian refugees in Jordan in the north, and we have two camps, Zaatari and Azraq. Now, I don't work in the camps. Mm -hmm. We were hoping to work with the host communities outside the camps, but again, I have no funding. So maybe, maybe if uh, I find funding, I will hopefully implement a program empowering women and teaching them about you know, their rights, like you said, you know, that they have the right to choose. Now, in Jordan, you can't choose. You know, mm. I'm not saying that I don't want women to be straight. And I'm not saying, I mean, I'm straight, but I have no problem if you're not straight. Mm. So, so you know what I'm saying. Mm. I'm saying you have the right to choose. And, and I will not discriminate against you if you're not like me. So this is something that also is not uh, uh, very, uh, uh, th this, this is not happening in Jordan. Jordan is a very homophobe uh, country. I mean, they're, sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, yes, they are homophobe. They, they will not accept someone to come out of the closet openly, even if it were a prince or a princess, and say that they are not straight. So this is, so it's not a very liberal country. But, but it's, I, I respect that, I respect that. I'm not trying to change the country. I'm just saying that we need to teach the people that there is something else around the world. You can't cover your eyes, you know? You know, we need to teach them, okay, this is not happening in Jordan, but it happens all over. And maybe it is happening in Jordan, but inside the closet, people don't come out of the closet. Because a girl might be married to somebody who's a homosexual, who is gay, and if she's married at a young age, she will always think that she is not that she was not able, she was not desirable, and she would not understand that he doesn't like all women. It's not her. You understand what I'm saying? Because when a girl gets married at a much younger age, 18, 19, 17, she doesn't have enough knowledge to know the difference. And she might just think that if the man is not interested in her, that that is specific to her and not that he is a gay guy who is not out of the closet. So we need to teach the women to, to know the difference. Mm. And also there are many diseases that men might have that they might uh, uh, transfer to the girl who is very innocent and she might end up with a disease just because we have a double standard society where males, uh, it is okay for a man to do whatever they want and so uh, 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 men are not condemned or judged for being very sexually active in, the, in this society, whereas women, uh, there is still the, you know, the virginity is, uh, is a very, there's a very high level to women, uh, to abstinence and women keeping themselves until they get married. And that's why they marry at a younger age. And, and, and so if, uh, if a man has been sleeping around and his wife was a very nice, clean girl who who was, uh, you know, and she didn't understand about uh, if, uh, STDs and the, uh, the husband had something. If she, if she were trained on it, when she looks at him on his, on his private, she can know maybe he has something. If she wasn't trained, she wouldn't know and she will catch that disease and suffer all her life. And even with, you know, things that could be preventable. So, so this is what I mean by education. I mean about educating the, the person. I am not saying the, uh, uh, I'm not changing. I don't want to change the society. I just think that this, they, they deserve to know. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't want to do anything about it. Even if I, I want, okay, I'm not, you know, they deserve to know the different types of diseases. 
even if they are not sexually active. And I am promoting abstinence. I am not saying go out and uh, have sex at a young age. On the contrary, for women empowerment, uh, it's better for them to, to be ready because this is not a joke, especially in this society, because they might end up being raped or molested or, 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 or harassed in a bad way. So they need to be strong enough to understand this. But, but I am just saying that they have the right to know whether they, and it's their decision. May and I'm not, that? you know, I am not promoting openness, but I am saying they have the right to know everything and then choose what to do with it. Mm. Yes. We can't, we can't say, don't teach them, don't, and, and nobody's, you know, when I, when I proposed three years ago, a, a, a component for teenagers, uh, about no smoking, no drugs, the, 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 the no smoking was relevant to cancer, no drugs relevant to drug addiction, and uh, safe sex, nobody implemented it in our schools. I said healthy nutrition, no uh, uh, healthy nutrition, uh, uh, safe sex, no drugs, and, and in safe sex, I promoted abstinence. I wasn't saying, I promoted abstinence or you know, safe sex for those who were going to college for, you know, because they, if they go to another country and it's an open country for them to know what to do to, to prevent disease. And nobody, uh, you know, I approached like seven or eight schools. Yes. Yeah, and nobody of the seven or eight schools or 10 schools, and we are talking about very uh, like um, international schools, None of the, the only school was an international uh, a British school. They got back to me. They said they do this in London, but they are not, uh, Jordan society is not ready for sexual education. Although in London and the US, they are ready. They do it all the time. All force to you, Rania, for the good work you are doing. Uh, we Thank are all with yeah, you. I see. And we, Thank we can, yes. Can we Thank move you on? very much for listening to me. Yes. yes. Can Thank we you. move on to the next question? Uh, Swapna Majumdar, a very senior journalist from India, would like to ask something. Uh, Swapna, would you like to ask your question, please? Please unmute yourself and you can ask, please. Is it better? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you, yes. Okay, thanks Shobha. Uh, thank you for the overview of Cambodia's health landscape. Uh, I just have two quick questions. Uh, one is uh, about how Cambodia managed to reduce taboos related to comprehensive sexuality education. And my second question is, uh, are there any lessons that Cambodia has learned from India regarding reproductive and sexual health and rights? Um, yeah, I, I have a uh, high respect for uh, India's uh, societies and uh, leadership um, also, but uh, for, I just talk in terms of a Cambodia experience. Um, as I said, first, uh, Cambodia society is uh, more open and tolerant on issues related to sexual and reproductive health and rights. But, um, Comprehensive sexuality education is uh, a very new concept for uh, Cambodia, the seniors and the Ministry of Education. Uh, but uh, we've been uh, doing this, you know, I remember first uh, we introduced um, adolescents uh, reproductive health education. We don't call it comprehensive sexuality education. So, um, you know, I think I remember 1997. So when uh, Cambodia was um, uh, high in uh, HIV AIDS uh, transmissions, so we get the opportunity to use HIV AIDS um, as an entry point for uh, educating uh, young people, adolescents. So uh, gradually uh, developing from uh, education about HIV AIDS for young people, then we uh, gradually introduce uh, other subject like uh, pregnancies, like uh, uh, STD. So, um, and then, you know, like uh, having sex and how to prevent sex. And of course, you know, previously uh, on the early days, there's also resentment uh, from parents, from media. But, uh, you know, we've been uh, involved inviting uh, officials from the government, Ministry of Education, of health to uh, 
uh, share and participate in the training sessions that we did for uh, young people. We inviting uh, village chief, the local authority to join the workshop, to open the workshop. So I think, uh, you know, uh, gradually um, the, the news and about um, sexuality education, the concept about uh, sexuality education uh, permeate, um, you know, like um, go into the minds and souls of uh, the officials. And I think, you know, as I said earlier, um, now the uh, Ministry uh, Education um, officially introduced uh, this subject as the uh, compulsory. So uh, it's not that uh, long uh, term compared to other country, but uh, seen 1990s. And then, you know, during uh, 1916, um, 17, then the ministry uh, decided to uh, introduce this as a compulsory subject. So it has been a gradual and ongoing battle which you have won eventually. I, I think so, yeah. But it's not only like uh, RAP, but there are also other NGOs, uh, development partner, UNFPA. So it, it cannot be one uh, organizations. And of course, you know, we have a supporter, like-minded uh, professional from academic, from the government, our friends with it in the Ministry of Health. So um, we are all together. So I, I think this kind of uh, movement uh, will uh, lead to the acceptance and introductions of this uh, comprehensive sexuality education. Okay, uh, we have uh, uh, Beryl Osendo from Kenya. Uh, Beryl, would you like to ask your question? Just unmute yourself. Yes. Um, I think I joined the meeting pretty late, so I won't be asking any question at the moment. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we have Rahul Zivedi from India. Uh, Rahul, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity uh, to ask the questions. And I would like to thank Zeron for uh, briefing us on all, uh, on what, on, on all what uh, Cambodia has achieved. And it's, you know, it's very, very appreciative that uh, uh, the comprehensive sex sexuality education has become a reality for the young people out there. So very good. I would like to know um, what needs uh, to be done more in, uh, in Asia Pacific region uh, in, in order to improve uh, the accessibility to sexual, sexual and reproductive health services, for, especially for uh, women and girls, young girls. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. So, um, so that's uh, what the Asia Pacific um, uh, region need to do more in terms of uh, sexual and reproductive health um, and rights, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I think, you know, there are um, uh, many um, examples in uh, across countries, uh, regions about um, uh, how to achieve this uh, SOHR uh, in particular uh, that we all promised in the uh, SDG. So um, I think there need to be, um, you know, a open uh, participation from uh, civil society, um, the um, meaningful participation from the population groups, uh, representative from the population groups. And I think uh, we need to bring the government uh, to be more accountable uh, for what they uh, promised uh, uh, for the uh, SDG. And uh, we all have to note that um, sexual and reproductive health rights, as I said earlier, is a um, uh, fundamental human rights and um, achieving SRHR uh, would also benefiting to many other uh, SDG uh, target. So uh, the governments and development uh, partners, uh, donors uh, need to be aware of this and it is um, our jobs, our roles as a CSO at the uh, population groups uh, need to 
uh, keep the uh, momentum high, as I said earlier, uh, do uh, uh, an organized uh, network, um, making a network cooperation uh, among um, like-minded uh, organizations and groups uh, across um, countries in the region, Asia, uh, Pacific, and uh, to get the, uh, bring, uh, make the government in Asia Pacific more accountable uh, on uh, sexual and reproductive health. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have a question from Norul Islam Haseb, who is special correspondent at Bangladesh Post. Uh, and he's also a founding member of APCAT Media, uh, that is Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and Non Communicable uh, and Prevention of Non Communicable Diseases, uh, media for that. Uh, Norul wants to know. Uh, he says that it is still a taboo to talk about sexual and reproductive health and rights services to young people in countries like Bangladesh. So what are your suggestions to policymakers uh, to rather undo this? And how would you involve Bangladesh in this conference? Yeah, um, and, and, and thank you. I, I, I think, um, you know, um, to... Um, uh, make uh, to ease, uh, you know, uh, these uh, situations on um, sexual and reproductive health uh, for uh, Bangladesh. Um, I think first uh, we need to have, uh, um, you know, I, I think he's talking about the um, young people, right? Yes, yes, young people, yes. Yeah, so I think first um, I talk in terms of um, experience from uh, Cambodia. So I think uh, we need to have a law and policy prohibiting uh, child marriage, uh, you know, marriage under age of uh, 18. And um, then, you know, uh, we, in Cambodia, we have a youth national, uh, national youth policies. And in the national youth policy, we must have language related to um, adolescent sexual and reproductive health we must have language related to comprehensive sexuality education. We must have language like uh, youth-friendly uh, services and the youth national policy. And, and also, you know, in Cambodia, we have uh, national population policy. And uh, for RA and other uh, organization, because uh, there's, there's an openness for Cambodian government for us to participate in so, and we have to make sure that there are certain language supporting SOHR in the uh, national population uh, policies. So I think these are the um, uh, policies and law at the uh, highest uh, uh, level. And um, you know, uh, CSOs and um, population, uh, population group representative uh, need to um, um, do uh, do more advocacies on that, you know, introducing um, like we call comprehensive sexuality educations in the community, in the schools, and we need to do more like uh, introducing youth friendly service, supporting the government public uh, health facility to provide these services, or we train um, the health service provider on the concept of uh, youth friendly services. So I think, uh, you know, we, we, we just need to do more and keep the momentum continue. Thank you. Uh, we have already run out of time, but I will just take in one more question uh, from Padamra Joshi, who is a senior journalist and editor from Nepal. Uh, Padamra says that uh, last year, the US government cut down aid uh, to developing countries like Nepal in areas of sexual and reproductive health, especially in the area of safe abortion services. What do you think would be the impact of this or has been the impact of this in developing countries in the Asia Pacific region, including Nepal? I, that's, that is a very serious, uh, you know, negative uh, impact on, um, you know, countries like uh, developing countries and many countries in Asia, Pacific, and Africa, and, and in the world. So those who have been uh, receiving support from uh, USAID, the U.S. Uh, governments, and then uh, when uh, the current uh, U.S. administration uh, came to the office, so this we call the global gag rules. And and um, I know you know there's a number of study data collections 
showing a high uh, negative impact through the funding cuts uh, to uh, these uh, organizations. And, uh, and um, I, I just want to say that uh, as a sexual and reproductive health and advocates and organization, um, so uh, we are looking into other support, but uh, we uh, thanks for the European commissions and governments in the uh, European uh, countries still uh, continue the support and replace uh, the funding that have been cut. But um, I don't think that uh, it's uh, come to the level as uh, we had the US uh, funding before. So I, I agree, I, I agree with you. Yeah, it's, it impacts us all. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Shivon, for being with us and spending so much of time with us and uh, attending to each of the questions in, uh, in a very, very comprehensive and very enlightening manner. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, friends, in this inaugural episode of APCR SHR 10 Dialogues, you were listening to Dr. Shivon Var convener of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive Health, Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights. Uh, APCR SHR 10 Dialogues is a special series of online interviews every fortnight with leaders from Asia Pacific on the theme of sexual and reproductive health and rights in Asia Pacific 2030 SDGs vision and the 2020 realities. This is also the theme of APCR SHR 10 and it is co-hosted by APCR, SHR 10, and CNS. And these online interviews are streamed live every fortnight from February to May 2020 in the lead up to the conference. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for the next episode, next fortnight of APCR, SHR 10 Dialogues. Have a good day.